it's interesting you obviously you've released a couple of pieces this week for the athletic that i definitely suggest people go and read uh one of them that sparked my interest and i think you know references the first thing to sort of speak about here is is regarding who chelsea have signed in january uh, in particular in attack uh noddy manawake of course it was, what, it was a Friday night. I think the deal was confirmed uh, by Chelsea um, from PSV. And, and you, it was one of those sort of classic athletic pieces, you know, deep dive into his career, data, Y Scout, all that good stuff. Link in the description box below for people to go and read it. But I sort of want to ask you about this, stra- this January strategy to pursue these wide players uh, in, in the case of Mudrick as well, because I don't think many of us especially from, I guess, my perspective and people I spoke to before January of if you would have said what are going to be the priority areas for Chelsea, I don't think two wingers were going to be on that list. Um, but I, in the case of, I think, both of these players, it, they have sparked excitement and, and intrigue from fans. Yeah, I think we we can't describe it as 100% strategy. <laughs> I think, it, especially when you're talking about January, it's at best it's a combination of strategy and opportunism because the January market is about the deals you you can get done practically as much as the players that you would ideally want um and we've seen that I think in in some other positions that Chelsea are looking at they're clearly highly motivated to sign a central midfielder but you're getting quoted prices like Enzo Fernandez's release clause or you know, 80 million plus for Moises Caicedo. You know, these these are the kind of fees that you get get touted routinely in January because they're generally um, designed to try and deter, deter interest rather than attract it because clubs don't want to sell their best players mid-season. So I think a lot of this has been motivated by what Chelsea can do um, rather than exactly what they want to do. And that... That comes into the midrick as well, I think, because we were told for a couple of weeks that Chelsea were watching Arsenal's attempts to sign Mudrick, that they weren't necessarily pushing, um, but they were interested in the player. And they were waiting to see whether Arsenal would um, would just you know tick every box that Shakhtar were looking for or whether a window of opportunity would open. And as it was, a window of opportunity opened because our Arsenal, I think, were were trying to negotiate quite hard with Shakhtar. Um, and so they went and did that deal. And, and, and Shakhtar were also motivated sellers, which I think PSV also are, if you look at what they did with Cody Gakpo this this window as well. They, they clearly need to raise money. Um, and Chelsea offered them a fee that I think no one else was prepared to for, for Madueki in, in this window. So they're... I don't know if they always intended to bring in two high profile first team wingers um, in this January, but the opportunity arose for them to sign two players that they really like. And they went and got it done. And, and, and that means that there are other areas of the squad, which I'm sure we'll get onto that still need to be addressed. But I think they feel like they've signed two quality players in a position that still needed to be addressed at some point. Yeah, I, I sort of I've been losing count of how many players Chelsea have actually signed this window. You know, usually are quite squeamish in terms of spending vast amounts, as you've said, because it is about opportunity. You know, sometimes that opportunity is an Olivier Giroud. I think that's one of the best ones we've done in recent years, where you bring in a player at a certain time and they offer value over a number of years. That's kind of what you're hoping in this period. And of course, you forget about the, the expensive loan for Joao Felix within there as well. And, and we've barely seen any of him because he decided to two foot someone. But I, I you know, it's, it's going to be curious to see what happens as we'll get to we're we'll asked you know we'll talk about the transfer deadline day but um another one of those names is Mikhailo Mudrik and you know we all saw his debut you you saw his debut at what I'm informed was a very cold Anfield and it wasn't a great game but I think he was he was the he was kind of the star of it I mean it, it feels like a provocative question uh but will Mudrik turn out to be the most important addition this new ownership has made at least in the first season yeah I mean I, I... I try and steer clear of hyperbole where I can um, in this job because I've I've seen enough times that first impressions are not always accurate in terms of what a player will give you over time. I remember Alvaro Morata having one of the most spectacular debuts. I can remember going to Stoke and scoring a hat trick at the Britannia in it and thinking, "Wow, Chelsea have got a proper superstar number nine and we all know where that ended up. Um, 
but sometimes the talent jumps out at you in in a, in a real way and i think that's what happened when Madrid came on at Anfield, there were lots of reasons why he shouldn't have been able to do what he did in that game. That, you know, he hadn't played a competitive minute since November. He'd barely trained with his new teammates, new league, new football culture, coming up, up against a very difficult team, albeit Liverpool have plenty of problems of their own right now, of course, in a difficult stadium, you know, a hostile atmosphere. And I'm not sure if this came through to everyone watching, but there was a really high wind. I know Jurgen Klopp's spoken about the wind in English football before, but it it was a problem in the game, I think. Um, So there were lots of reasons why he should have had a pretty forgettable and maybe quite difficult debut, but he immediately looked like the most dangerous attacker on the pitch. And this was a a pitch that had Mohamed Salah on it. Um, I think he, he, he adjusted to the intensity of the game and the speed of the game really, really quickly. It helped maybe that he was up against the 37-year-old at right back for, for a little while when he came on. But you could see the speed. I think more, more encouragingly for Chelsea, because they, they knew they were getting the speed with Madrid. More encouragingly, I think you saw a real intelligence in tight spaces, um, a really, really good decision-making, a natural awareness of where his teammates were, an ability to not just you know, play the obvious forward pass, but the clever forward pass that isn't so obvious that sets up a shot. Um, and 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 there was, of course, that real, you know, flashbulb moment where he he passes the ball to Gallagher, gets the gets the loose ball back off him, and that wonderful, really lightning shimmy to go round Joe Gomez. And it's a shame he couldn't finish it off because it would have been an absolutely brilliant goal and a, a very good introduction to what I think Madrid can be. At Chelsea, um, you know he's he's got that level of talent to be a real sort of game changing winger in this league, and I, I, I'm I'm very encouraged. I think that he that he showed that on his debut, given the circumstances, and I, I don't see any reason why, as he gains more familiarity with his new surroundings and his new teammates, that we can't see more of it and that he can't get even better. I do think there is a slight concern for me, as you've mentioned, of you know those early impressions and coming off the bench and the game being a little bit dead, and you know, and then you you sort of contrast that with, as you've rightly pointed out, the environment, the pressure, the stadium, the expectation. Uh, but you know, you look at Lukaku's impact at the Emirates um, and his early weeks at Chelsea, where it looked like this is it. You know, Chelsea finally signed the striker, and the more he became used to his surroundings and the players he seemed to get worse. He seemed to, and I think you could even argue that Raheem Sterling, Mark Correa, Kaladu Koulibaly have, have, for different reasons, I think those are all, all those players, I'm, I think we could say there's different situations and different variables of any player. But I, my concern with Mudrik, with Drow Felix is, are they going to be dragged down? Because I, you know, I, I, I do wonder if our excitement over Mudrik is, we haven't seen someone do that at Chelsea that excitement, that raw maverick player. I mean, I, that's is that a concern for you? Because that is just like, did we see something really encouraging or is it just we've been starved of attacking expression for so long at Stamford Bridge? Well, I, I, I do get that. And I think there were there were shades of the reaction to Mudrick's debut in Joao Felix's debut against Fulham, wasn't there, earlier this month, where for an hour, all I was seeing on, on Twitter and, and you, you got it from the occasional oohs and ahs from the Chelsea away fans as well was wow there's there's a Chelsea attacker that's just not afraid to try things and has the ability to pull them off and is is sort of playing decisively on instinct and, and even though he wasn't scoring he was a constant threat and I think you got a similar a similar feeling from Mudrick watching him yeah there are reasons to be cautious I mean I said before the game that I felt in some ways you know, with the difficulties to one side, Liverpool could be an ideal debut opponent for someone like Madrid because they play high up the pitch. They do give you space. At that time, I thought they were going to start Trent at right back rather than Milner. But either way, you've got someone that you can attack and, and get joy out of 1v1. It, a lot In a lot of weeks, as we know, Chelsea are going to be facing very disciplined, very organised low blocks and teams determined to try and stop Chelsea doing what they want to do and, and then counter-attacking them. 
that's something Mudrik going to have to learn to deal with because he played a lot in transition at Shakhtar. That was their deliberate game plan to maximise him. Chelsea do get transition opportunities, and I think they, you know, a key part of Mudrik's success will be them finding ways to find him faster in those situations. That was part of my Mudrik piece. Was I think a lot of Chelsea players aren't wired to find the quick forward pass at the moment, that, and that's not because they can't. It's just because they're not necessarily attuned to looking for it. It's not the way they've been playing the last few years. Um, but the other thing that really encouraged me, I, I felt, about Mudrik's debut was what I said before, how good he was in tight spaces at finding passes and the fact that he showed the ability to beat players in small spaces as opposed to big distances. And I think he's going to need both. If you're going to be a game-changing winger at Premier League level in a top team, you know, Mo Salah has that. You look at um, someone like Riyad Mahrez who's playing out of his mind at the moment. He's got the ability to do that. Um, you look back in Chelsea history, Eden Hazard had the ability to be a force in transition, but also to break teams down when they were in a low block. And Mudrik flashed ability to to grow into a player that can do both. And I think mm. that that's got, if he can do that, then I don't see why he can't be a big success. Yeah, you do need it. It's not just about the system and the players around him. I think you also do need... Um, that player as you say that's going to make a difference it's going to take things up a, a few gears especially as as we know at Stamford Bridge on like a 3pm when you've got a low block um, and as we saw with Timo Werner when that space was not there to just hit the ball to him to run onto like he had it in the Bundesliga and that's the thing I think Christopher Nkunku is probably going to have to adapt to as well although I do think Nkunku is a is a more technically gifted player, but it's it's a massive uh, transition, as we know. 